Hello, my friend. Welcome back to another episode on the Happiness Happens podcast. I am Simona, and I'm so excited to have you on today's show. I feel like I say that every single time, but let me tell you why. Instead of just telling you that I am excited, let me tell you why I'm excited, because today's guest is such an interesting conversation that I am so grateful I got to have. We are talking a lot about unlocking your purpose and living in your unique potential, but we're also talking about religion versus spirituality and being accepting of different religions and in a way that also allows you to challenge and to question them. So of course, we talk a lot about the spirituality of self and religion's involvement in that. And so when you're listening to this conversation today, I just want to encourage you to have an open mind. We all have our own beliefs. We all have our own ideas. We all have our own things that we support in this world. And I also think it's really important to approach different conversations and different topics with an open mind. So I hope you love this conversation. We are learning about how to tap into our inner power, and my guest, Christian, is going to help us do just that. So I'm really excited for you to get into this conversation. We're also going to be talking about our history with religion and spirituality and how that plays into our understanding of self and our personal journeys towards fulfillment and happiness. With 30 years of experience, Christian De La Huerta is a sought-after spiritual teacher personal transformation coach, and leading voice in the breathwork community. He has traveled the world offering inspiring and transformational retreats, combining psychological and spiritual teachings with lasting and life-changing effects. He is an award-winning, critically acclaimed author, has spoken at numerous universities and conferences, and also on the TEDx stage. He has a new book that is out that we're going to talk a little bit about as well that has been described by multiple Grammy Award winner Gloria Estefan as a bomb for the soul of anyone searching for truth and answers to life's difficult questions. So get ready. Let's get into this conversation and be sure to send me a message and send Christian a message and let us both know what you think of this episode. What did you learn? What was your favorite part? Take a screenshot of you listening to it. Tag us on social media. It's at Happiness Happens Podcast. And okay, I think that's pretty much it. If you love what you hear, leave me a five-star rating and review on either Apple or Spotify or wherever you're listening to this podcast. And with that, let's get into the conversation. Welcome to the Happiness Happens podcast, Christian. I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to speaking with you. Yes, me as well. I always love connecting with different people in this space and just understanding what happiness means to you and how it has come to you and, you know, understanding your work and all of the amazing things that you're doing. So before we dive into all the other good stuff, can you please tell me in your opinion, what does happiness mean to you? Hmm. You know what word I relate to more than happiness is fulfillment. Mm. Happiness, you know, sometimes can come across as a little bit trite, but to me, it, it, whatever the word is, it has to do with self-acceptance and self-love. If, if you've got that going, then the rest of it is just details. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think that's a really great perspective. And you know, it's funny that you say that about happiness because before I started having all these conversations about happiness, and before I started even trying to understand it or had a podcast about it, you know, I would look at happiness and kind of be like, okay, well, this is like this thing that most people want to achieve in their lives and most people want to have more of in their lives. But I, I don't think that we all understand fully what that actually means. And one thing that I've learned through this journey is that happiness is firstly so many different things to so many different people. Yes, exactly. But secondly, there's so many different ways to describe it, you know? Yeah. 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 To me, like another layer of that for me is a fulfillment is being on purpose. Like, yes. like living what I what I came here to do like, like mm -hmm. fulfilling that unique human potential that nobody else can mm -hmm. because nobody else has the same you know DNA the same set of experiences the same skills the same preferences that each one of us has so if if we don't bring that unique human potential forth ain't nobody else gonna do it Exactly. Oh, that is so true. Truer words have not been said, have never been said. You know, okay, what I love that you said right there, though, is this piece about fulfillment and honoring the path that you're meant to be taking while you're here and the lessons that you're meant to learn and the stuff that you're meant to go through. I want to hear a little bit about your journey to how you got to where you are 
right now. And what point did you realize what journey you should be fulfilling, like what your purpose was here, if you will? Well, it's a great question. You know, I don't know that there was actually one point, but it was definitely some, you know, themes, recurring themes. Like when I was a kid, I grew up in Cuba. I was born in Cuba. I lived there for mm. my first 10 years. And I was one of nine kids, you know, very Catholic family. And growing up, I thought first that I wanted to be a priest. My, my parents had a lot of priest friends, so I wow. looked up to them. Then I realized that the religion in which I was raised did not have room for me. Mm-hmm. So that, you know, I moved on and found other ways to connect and to express my, my, spiritu- my spirituality. Mm-hmm. And so then you know, I studied psychology. My dad was a psychiatrist. I studied psychology. So there was still that same theme of wanting to help other people be happier, for, mm-hmm. for lack of another word, be more fulfilled, you know, work, work through their their hang-ups and, and their traumas and their whatever was, whatever was in their mind holding them back from being all that they could be and from living their dreams. And then I realized that even that traditional path of psychology, I was on a track to get a PhD, and realized that even that wasn't enough for me because it, it completely missed and neglected the whole spiritual. Hmm. So what I do now is, you know, I do retreats, I do life coaching, I'm an author, I do the same thing that we were talking about, helping people get free from whatever's holding them back and from fulfilling their dreams and having the kind of relationships that they dream about and long for and the kind of lives that, that are filled with meaning and purpose and having a sense of personal empowerment as they go through life. And these days, I, it's more like a psycho-spiritual approach. So definitely use some of my psychology background and we've been some teachings, spiritual teachings from different traditions. Mm, that's amazing. I have so many different ways that I want to go from here right now. The first thing I will say, though, is I love that you blend that psychology part with the spiritual part. I think that is where you can capture two different very types, like two different types of people. You know, the types of people who are like, you know, forget about spirituality. It doesn't really exist. Da, 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 da. And then you have the people who, you know, are like, you know, everything should be based in spirit and everything should be based in faith, right? Where it's not necessarily the case because there is a very beautiful blend between the two. Would you agree? Oh my God. Yes. You know, to me, they're all, they're all parts of being human. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we tried to, you know, part of the reason that, that I, you know, that I think was your questions that you were going to ask me, what, how come, Catholicism didn't have room for me is that I knew yeah. from a young age that I was gay. And so wow. there I was, you know, with this, this part of me wanting to serve humanity, wanting to serve the sacred as, a, you know, a God as I understood it then. And yet being told by the religion in which I was raised that I was going to go to hell for eternity and that I was an abomination in the eyes of mm. God. And so, you know, just in the, in the same way that I know many people try to struggle with and, and try to reject their sexuality, like, like I did, many of us try to reject our spirituality because we confuse it. We confuse it with organized religion. And no mm-hmm. wonder, I mean, with all due respect to, to the, the good that religion has brought to humanity, it's also caused and still causes a huge amount of pain and confusion. And so, you know, I don't believe in abominations. But if I were to believe in abomination, it would be the, the externalization of the sacred, like putting the sacred outside of us, mm-hmm. because that has impacted so much the way that we see ourselves and the way that we treat the planet, the, the mm-hmm. way that we treat each other. I love that. I relate to this so much because I was raised a Roman Catholic, like, you know, just that's my, that's what I was raised. I was baptized, all, all of the things, right? And, you know, when I, and I, you know, okay, I tell this story sometimes, I haven't told this story in a long time, but when I was growing up, I think a lot of kids too, when you're growing up, you don't really realize that, you know, gay or straight or this or that, like you don't really realize that there's a difference until someone gives that significance and gives it that meaning. Um, And I remember once I was talking to my mom, I was so small, I think it was like six or something like that. And I had this realization, maybe I was like a little bit older, eight or something like that, and I had this realization. And my, so my mom's brother is gay, and him and his partner have been together for, oh gosh, like since before I was born, and I'm 30, so a long time. And I remember saying to her one day, I think I came home, and I was like, is my uncle gay? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, oh, 
okay, like that's great. Like, okay, wonderful. And it always was such a normal thing, but it's, it's so it's kind of interesting for other people to like have a different view about that. And I, I guess I, I don't want to go too far into that because people do really do have very polarizing views on it. But, you know, I think we give things so much meaning when there doesn't have to actually be that meaning. And sometimes there's so much power in just letting people be who they authentically are. Like, why do we have to decide what other people should be? Why is that any of anyone else's concern? You know? Exactly. No, and I think what you were alluding to, which I, it's so important that nobody is born hating. Nobody is born a racist. Yeah. Nobody is born a misogynist or, or, you know, as, or a homophobe. That is taught. And God, as I understand it today, would have nothing to do with any of that. Absolutely mm -hmm. nothing. Exactly. I think that's the part, too, where I would get a little bit confused about the Catholic faith specifically was, you know, I didn't understand, like, why things had to be that specific like, way. Why couldn't they be this and this? You know what I mean? Like, why did there have to be so many different conditions on the way that we live and, and all of that? And for a long time, I, like, rejected this whole idea of, like, religion because I was like, no, you know? And so, I mean, now I kind of use the term interchangeably. I'm not an overly religious person, but I'm a very spiritual person. And I think that's a beautiful spot to be in, but just as is being in whatever religion you're in too, like they can all coexist, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, the way that I, like I honor all those religions mm -hmm. and I challenge them as mm -hmm. well. So, you know, to the degree that a religion is, is making us better human beings, more compassionate, more loving, that they're helping us to, to connect with the sacred, to live and to embody the sacred, mm -hmm. and to live from those highest values, then they're doing their job. Yeah. To the degree that they're, they're seeding and causing separation and hatred and competition and, you know, what I call the theological pissing contest. You know, my God is bigger than yours. It's like, you know, then I but challenge that. Like <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah. That's a really, really, really good point. And I think, you know, I, I know I know for myself, like one place that I always make sure that I'm sitting in is this like place of just understanding of other people always. And I feel like you're very similar to that, you know, that, you know, uh, for me, people can kind of do and be whatever it is that they want to do and be. I think as long as you're not hurting people, you know, there's a definite like boundary there. But, you know, we are all like we were talking about in the beginning are here on our own path and our own journey. And we all need to learn our own lessons while being here. Some people will be more in that religion route. Some people will be more in the spiritual side. Some people, it'll be something completely different. Some people, it'll be a business. Like, you know, there's so many different layers to that, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and people who I've met, you know, many, many times who thought they were atheist, you know, the, the deeper we got into the conversation, the more that we realized that not really. You know, because if we're talking about God as, a, as an old man with a white beard and, you know, the, the tunics and surrounded by a choir of angels and busybody and micromanaging and punitive and sending people to hell, then, then, then I'm an atheist too. But, you know, once we begin to expand our, our conception of the divine and realize that we are not separate from that, that it mm -hmm. lives in us and we are an expression of it, then, you know, then that kind of handles the the moral questions because am, am i am i personally going to go by you know moral teachings that were written and translated and retranslated and mistranslated and stuff was taken out of this holy text and stuff was put in and and written at a time you know where they were taken out of their cultural and, and historical context where women weren't even human women were property at, at that time am i going to base my my choices about what's right and wrong on that is like mm, i don't think so yeah. But if, if we go by what we're talking about, like if, you know, to one of the, my favorite concepts from Hinduism is namaste. So, you know, the, the sacred in me, the, the highest in me, the, 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 the God in me, whatever you want to call it, sees and honors and bows to that in you. If mm -hmm. we live that way, how could I steal from you or rape you or, or invade your country for that matter? Mm -hmm. uh, if I yeah. see that in you, which, which is also in me, how can we mistreat each other that way? No, that's exactly it. It's such a good point. And I couldn't help but laugh when you were saying that earlier about, you know, the picture that most people have about God in their mind. Because when I was growing up and we were going to church, the, the main priest at the church we would go to, 
was an older man with white hair and a white beard. <laughs> and he, for so long, for so long, I actually thought that he was like when I was really little. I thought that he was actually God, and that now is who I actually think about still all these years later. If I need to put like a face to it, I think of that man. <laughs> Oh my goodness. But on the flip side, I was listening to this thing the other day. I actually think I came across it on TikTok of all places. And I was just scrolling and watching these videos. And someone had said, what if God is water? Okay, like what if? And for people who are listening right now, if you're very religious, like maybe... I'm not trying to be insulting in this conversation. We're not trying to be like offensive or anything like that. We're just having a candid conversation. And so anyway, so the, the thing that they were saying is like, what if... God is water. Okay, then that would mean God is living in you, is outside of you, wraps around you, is in every fiber of your being, every, you know, fiber of your life, because everything is made up of water, everything, right? And I was like, that is such a cool perspective to look at. Yeah, I think it's beautiful. (laughs) And, and, you know, because in in the Eastern religions, I mean, now some of them do, that, you know, but traditionally the Eastern religions didn't have that split between the physical and the spiritual like the Western religions do. And the indigenous traditions all over the world, you know, they consider everything sacred, whether it's the clouds or the, the, the rugs mm-hmm. or the fish in the sea or the creepy crawlies, it's all sacred. But even if we're going to go by the Western religions that claim that God is omnipresent, that God is everywhere, well, don't tell me that God is everywhere except for the bedroom. Mm. And, and the human body and the genitals. Mm. Uh, you know, so it's, it's either everywhere or it's not. Yeah, yeah, that is so, it's such an interesting way of looking at it, you know, it, I, this idea that it's in everything. And, Every- right? And, you know, another thing that you were saying that I was thinking about earlier when you were talking about your journey, and this was the other half of the conversation that I was like, okay, I could, we could go one of two ways here. And so I want to I wanna bring it back to this really quick. So when you're talking about, you know, people discovering that life that they really want to live for themselves. I want to know from your perspective, what is that block that a lot of people seem to get stuck on? Because, you know, I think a lot of the times people will have an idea of what they want for their lives. You know, they'll know they want it to be fulfilled. Like it wants to feel fulfilling. But what would you say is that thing that holds people back from being able to actually go in and access that and, and live that life? It's a, it's a four-letter word that starts with F, fear. Oh. Um, I was like, wait, it could be a lot of four-letter words that start with F. <laughs> fear, you know, fear of failure, fear of success, fear of being judged, mm-hmm. fear of you know, not being accepted, fear of, fear of rejection, et cetera. Just so mm-hmm. many fears, that fears of being good enough, the imposter syndrome. And so what happens is that we settle. Mm-hmm. We have these dreams and we have, you know, the sense of why we're here. You know, fear of paying the bills, survival fear. And yet we fear that, that you know, unless we do what's expected of us or, or what we went to school for or what our parents thought we should study or what society thinks that we should do, then we're not going to survive or, or people are not going to like us or we're going to end up rejected and alone. And who wants that? Mm-hmm. And the thing is that the more we go on this journey of personal discovery and exploration and the stronger that our sense of self becomes the less than we then become dependent on anything external we don't need anybody's external validation we don't need anybody's approval we get to be who we are wherever we are Mm -hmm. and counterintuitively the more that we do that the more that we step into our power the more that the world eventually aligns with that not initially. Initially, there's going to be an adjustment period, and pe- there will be some people who will judge it, and there will be some people who won't be in our lives once we, we dive into our, our life journey authentically. But the ones who count and what is of love will be there on the other side. Hmm. I love that. That is so beautifully put. And you're right. It is fear. It is the fear of not being enough, not doing enough, not being able to do the actual thing you want to do, but also you know, is so ingrained into us, I think, by the stories that we get told about who we are as people. And maybe it's a story we don't even subscribe to, right? Like, you know, your parents can have X, Y, and Z story about who you are and how you should live your life. So do your friends. So does your partner. So do your kids. Like, you know, all these different things. But it's like, what story is true for you at the end of the day? And starting to decipher that, right? Yeah. And that's 
that what, that's what makes happiness possible. Because hmm. right? nobody, nobody's going to be able to tell us. Nobody else knows what's going to make us happy. Nobody knows. Because it's different, like you were saying, it's different for each of us. Mm -hmm. So only we are going to be able to know what, do we, you know, what, are, what do we like, what, what don't we like, what are our preferences, what, are, what do we believe. And, mm -hmm. and it's what, you know, what makes us happy, what, what makes us come alive, what brings us joy. And you know, we only, that process only of discovery only begins by going within. Mm -hmm. right? By having, the, and it's a courageous journey to look at ourselves. And, and to go within, because our whole society is set up to do the opposite, to numb out, exactly. to, to run away from our feelings, to, to, to numb out in all the infinite ways that we numb out, whether it's with substances or food, you know, drugs or alcohol or sex or TV or gaming or social media, or maybe even over-exercising, all the, all the things that we do to, to numb out and not feel and not think about ourselves. But the thing is, like, all the stuff that we're running away from, as we know, it doesn't go away. It only festers underneath the surface and gets worse and worse and begins to have an impact mm -hmm. on our relationships and preventing, to, preventing us from the happiness that we're really longing for. And so it's, it's a heroic journey to dive within and to face ourselves, to, to face down our inner demons, our fears, our doubts, and all that kind of stuff. And it works. It's like I know self-doubt intimately. I know self-hatred, actually. My entire adolescence was, was one long depression. Flash forward to today, and no matter the, the details of my life, no matter what's going on, no matter the circumstances, whether a relationship works out or it doesn't, a project succeeds or it fails, in quotes, my, my sense of self, unshakable. It's like, I know who I am, and I know what my worth is, and, and that is priceless. And so I know if that can happen to me, it can happen in anybody. Mm, I love that. And this is something that you talk about a lot, is this idea of personal power and really harnessing that personal power. If you could give our listeners, you know, one tip or three tips or however many tips you want in terms of accessing and really harnessing that inner power so that they can, you know, shift through and sort of trans transform the energy of that self-doubt and, and that place of not feeling like enough into that empowering place where it doesn't really matter what's going on on the external, all that matters is the internal. What would you say? Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, and I get into this deeply in Awakening the Soul of Power. Yes. So, you know, first thing is getting clear about our relationship to power, understanding our relationship to power, because most of us have a, an ambivalent, and I would even say conflicted, relationship to power. Part of us wants it, part of us is afraid of it. And I think mm -hmm. what we fear, Simona, is that if we really step in, into our power, if we really beat all of who we are, that other people wouldn't be able to handle it, yeah. and that you know, they might feel threatened, and we might end up rejected and alone. And again, who wants that? We also fear that we might abuse it, and no wonder. Like, all we gotta do is turn on the news any given day to witness at least one abuse of power. Mm -hmm. And who wants to be an abuser? We don't want to, we don't know, good people don't want to do that. We, all, we also have been you know, conditioned to believe that power is a bad thing with quotes mm -hmm. like power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And again, who wants to be corrupted? But what they didn't tell us about that quote is that Lord Acton, who spoke them, was speaking specifically about mm -hmm. political power, not personal power. So when we can add to that mix the fact that we've been conditioned to believe that the emotions are, are weakness, that they're bad, that, you know, that, that we, run, we hate conflict, we run away from confrontation, we run away from our own emotions, what happens is that we end up giving our power away, mm -hmm. our, our innate, inherent power that nobody can give to us, nobody can take away. We are the only ones who give it away, and the sad part, Simona, is the reasons for which we give it away, because they're kind of lame. So we say yes, when inside we really feel no, for an illusion of security. We override our true feelings, our beliefs. You know, we settle for less and stuff ourselves into smaller little packages for a false sense of security and acceptance. And, and we settle for morsels, for crumbs of pseudo-love. And so it's not a really good strategy. And so what this book is about is how to be guiding the reader by the hand as how to step into power, mm -hmm. personal power, in a way that's not about hierarchy or fear or, or force or control that doesn't require that we push anybody down, step on them in order for us to feel that we're more powerful. 
so rather than power over, it's power with. And, and that there's a way that we can do that in a way that's a match for us. Okay, I love that. That is really great. Your book sounds absolutely incredible. I have not read it yet, but it sounds super powerful in the sense that it's so important to really harness our own power within. You know, I am similar to you in the sense, I mean, I'm, you and I have had very different life experiences, very different lived experiences, but I think where we could relate on some level is this idea of, you know, not feeling worthy enough, not feeling good enough, especially growing up. Like, you know, and I think a lot of the times too, and I don't know what you think about this, but this is just something I've been thinking about lately. The idea that, you know, every soul is here on its journey and every single person is here, you know, to li have the lived experience that they're meant to be living, right? I think that I know for myself, I've always been someone in my family who's been the black sheep. I've always been the one who's had, you know, the different idea, the crazy idea, this, that, like all this different stuff. But even in like situations with other people, always have been very much, like I want to say like an outcast, okay? Like I think, but I think that it makes sense though now that I look back because it needed to happen that way in order for that personal power to be harvested and like created within and do the things, the really hard things that not a lot of people are aligned to doing and not because they don't want to just because they don't know how yeah no i think you're absolutely right about that you know i, I think that growing up with that sense of feeling different mm. of of that pain of that alienation of thinking that there's something wrong with us if we're willing to to dive into it and to ask you know like look into the why and how that got there and what makes us do the things we do and why do we feel those ways the rewards are so powerful and so infinite because the reward for that is, is self-acceptance. It opens mm -hmm. the door to self-acceptance, which then makes self-love possible. And it also it makes us compassionate. Like, I don't need to know the details of what was going on in your life, but when you, when you speak that way, it's like when, when I know that you struggled with self-esteem is I know exactly what you went through exactly. without knowing the details. It's like I can totally relate. Exactly. And I think most of us can. I think most of us have struggled with some degree of, of feeling like there was something wrong with us, that, that we were damaged goods, that, that we had to prove our worth or prove that we were our lovable. And, and to me, that's the core. That's at the core of all of it, including happiness and having relationships that can work. Mm, I love that so much. Oh, I could talk to you all day, Christian. I love this conversation. I want to hear just a tiny bit more before we sort of start to end off here. I want to hear a tiny bit more about your book. I want to know why you wrote it and where it came from within you, but also where people can find it and find you. All right. I think what, what, what inspired me was, I'll tell you this story. I was, I was sitting in meditation, and for only the second time in my life, I heard audible words, you know, like words that were not inside of my head. Yeah. And the words were the soul of power. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. I got the URL the next day and forgot about it. A month later, I had submitted a, a book proposal to a, an agent that I was working with at the time in New York who said to me, yeah, I love the idea, but I want to see some of these marketing plans, ideas implemented before we pitch it to a publisher, which would have taken me a year to implement the marketing oh, yeah. ideas. So it was like me putting on the brakes and it sent me into like a bit of a crisis for a few days. Right? What am I going to do now? If I'm not going to write about that, then what am I really going to write about? And then I thought, well, what would I really write about if I were not going to write for an advance? Like what's, what's in there? And then like in those three days where I was thinking and being living in that question, it, it was like one of those, you know, forehead palm, palm to the forehead is like, duh, I hadn't seen it. Because for years I've been saying that the single most important thing that needs to happen in the world is the empowerment of women. Hmm. Not to put women up on a pedestal, not to idealize women. Women also abuse power, as you and I both know, because we all do. And, but it's because, and it's certainly not to give women more crap that they have to clean up on this planet. But it's because as a world, as a species, we've been running so off balance, so off kilter when it comes to the balance between the masculine and the feminine energies. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe that when women are in 50% of power in this world, and we're not even close to that, that we're going to have a very different relationship to war and poverty and hunger and social justice and education and how we treat the environment to all of it. 
So for me, it's like a strategic thing, right? What is one thing that we could do that then is going to impact all the other problems and challenges that we're facing? And so the book is for everybody because we all, again, struggle with those issues around power and giving our power away and issues around self-esteem and all the stuff that you and I and feeling unworthy and all the stuff you, we've been diving into. But it has that particular message about the empowerment of women. Mm-hmm. And then I add a, one chapter about what it means to be a man in the 21st mm-hmm. century. Yeah. Kind of cool. redefining, up, up, upgrading masculinity for the 21st century. Because we've been running with from very old and you know, just no longer sustainable <laughs> definitions of what it means to be a man, which are very limiting. And of course, the patriarchal system of the last several thousand years, you know, women have paid a huge price for that and with the lack of equality. But men have also paid a price, paid a price for that. And one of the ways in which men, like if we look at a couple of statistics kind of quickly, so the suicide rate in Mm. in the U.S., men commit suicide four times as frequently as women do. And in fact, 70% of the suicides in the U.S. are committed by middle-aged white men, which is still the group that no matter which way you look at it, still holds the majority of the power in the world. And so we would think, you know, why is that? Shouldn't the, the group with the most power still you know, have more benefits and more privileges and live longer, but it doesn't work that way because women outlive men by five years in the U.S., by seven years globally. So what's going on there? And I think that part of it is because of these limiting definitions of of what it means to be a man, one of which is you walk around, you know, like this, like uncaring, unfeeling robots because we've been conditioned since we were boys, little boys don't cry. Yeah. And so many faulty assumptions about that, I mean, you know, that, the, that the emotions are weakness or that the feminine is weakness. But maybe that's for another conversation. Oh, love <laughs> to have that conversation with you. <laughs> You'll have to come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and in terms of where to reach me, probably, you know, the book is available wherever books are sold. Um, whether it's your local bookstore if you want to support them or you can also get it on Amazon. Amazing. And in terms of reaching me, probably the best way is my website soulfulpower.com S-O-U-L-F-U-L-P-O-W-E-R and for your audience if they will go to soulfulpower.com and subscribe to my email list and we all know how easy it is just click unsubscribe if it doesn't work for you oh yeah Uh, and I'm not going to take it personally (laughs) I'm the same Uh, with mine (laughs) you know but anybody who who does get on the email list will send them a sample chapter from the book We'll send them some power practices that are designed to integrate those teachings into our lives. And we'll send them a guided meditation about how to live in trust in these times of uncertainty and fear that we live on, live in. That's amazing. I will put all of those notes, all of those links in the show notes so that everyone can just click and access it very easily. But Christian, before we leave today, I would love to ask you a question I've been asking on my show for about three years now, and I never get the same answer, and I'm kind of feeling like you're probably going to give me a different out-of-the-box answer, which I love. Um, No pressure, though, if you don't. Uh, But it's how can someone create a little more happiness in their day every day starting today? You know, take even five minutes a day, even five minutes Devote, devote them to yourself, right? So, so no TV, no texting, no talking to anybody else, just five minutes, whether you go on a walk, whether you, you know, lock yourself in the bathroom if you don't have physical space, in five minutes and just slow down your breath, allow your breath to slow down. When, when we slow down the breath, the heart has no choice. The heart also has to slow down. And this is, you know, I'm describing a form of meditation, which is just to watch your breath. As as the heart slows down, the nervous system begins to quiet down, and we begin to relax. And we walk around with all this, like, stress all the time, for which we pay a price in, in, in our health. If you just slow down the breath and just be with yourself and watch yourself, notice what are you thinking about, what are you feeling, and without jumping on on the wagon, right? Just, just observing. For five minutes, you're just observing. So maybe you're doing your, your shopping list. All right, there it, there it is. I'm doing my shopping list. Go back. I'm mm-hmm. just observing. I'm just feeling. What am I noticing? What am I hearing? What am I sensing? What's the breeze, right? Just become like awareness rather than somebody, you know, we walk around like doing, doing, doing and running around from one place to, to each other. If we just gift ourselves five minutes to just be, that's all we got to do. Just be. Mm. I love that. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for joining me on this conversation today, Christian. It was so lovely having you as a guest. 
Thank you so much, Simona, for having me on the show, and thank you for having the show, because I know that your work and your, your, your messages heal and make a, lot of, make a difference in a lot of people's lives. Thank so thank you. you. Thank you. That's so kind of you to say. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you so much, everyone, for tuning into this week's episode on the Happiness Happens podcast. I hope you love this conversation. You know what I'm going to say. Be sure to connect with us. Find us online. Let us know you're listening. Let us know what you love. I hope you have a beautiful day ahead. And remember, happiness happens when you're...